Welcome back, folks. On this channel, my critiques and my analysis are not only limited to real-world car designs. Something I'd love to do is to look at what designers are capable of doing when they're not limited to the realities of homologation, certification, and rules. And one of the best places to find this uncapped creativity is in the world of video games. And that's what we're gonna to do today. And so without further ado, let's have a good look at the cars in Burnout Paradise. Welcome to Paradise City, the home of burnout driving. As a newcomer to the city, you've been granted a learner's permit. The world is full of surprises. What happens next is completely up to you. And the first one is the Carson Fastback Special. So right off the bat, we're looking at a car that definitely has a lot of influence from American Iron, American Muscle Cars. You can see a Ford uh, almost a Ford Torino look to it. You can see a Chevy Camaro in there. The greenhouse definitely gets, gives it away. There's a lot of, like I said, of that almost a new Camaro type look to it. And there's even the influence of, you remember the Pontiac Firebird Trans Am with the decal graphic on the hood. So it's a powerful bruiser of a vehicle, American iron to say the least. You wouldn't see a car styled like this today, which is great. This is what we want to see. Cars designed without any respect for rules and regulations. I like that because it's a chance to free up. Too often we're held back by, you know, is it gonna kill somebody, a pedestrian? Is it gonna run over uh, a puppy? Or is it gonna do something nasty? So it's got that, that look with the deep set headlights tucked way back in there. It's got that, that deep eye socket look. Very reminiscent of that guy who played Highlander, played Tarzan, Christopher Lambert really sinister looking eye, eye, eyeballs. I would love to see this car probably murdered out. In other words, everything black on this car, everything that can be black and deep chrome, I would definitely like to see this car like that. But in terms of size, presence, and, uh, and, and image, I think this car uh, would be the one I would want to wreck or at least cause mayhem and, and havoc in the city. I think this car would look absolutely stunning and at its best in the aftermath of a crash and still going strong. Ultimately, this is not a getaway car, but it is definitely a get out of the way car. Next car, let's move on. This is the Montgomery Hyperion. Now, great name, ugly car. This is uh, a, 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 an amalgamation, sort of a potpourri, sort of a, a minestrone type design of the worst of the worst cars put together. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to find something nice to say about this car. Maybe I should just praise it for the the ugliness of it and that it has the bravery to, to actually be out there on the road. If this car was a kit car, I would believe it because the front fenders and the rear fenders are pretty much the same width, I would say. But look at that door, it's just so offset that you're creating, naturally creating an air intake on the rear by that offset and an air outlet on the front. But my gosh, is that brutally done. It's not handsome, it's not beautiful in any way. It's got those uh, side marker lights tacked on to the fenders, it's required in the US, but like I said, they do look tacked on. So what I, what I don't like about this car is basically the proportions. I, 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 you know, we all like low, wide uh, cars, long even, because then you can start to play with a lot more surfacing and, and, and engage the front with the middle and with the back. But this car, like I said, it's kind of hard to read it as, as a car, as, as, as one car. So if the Carson Fastback Special was an archetype of an American muscle car where they're pulling in the best elements of, of that era, here, if this was a British car, they basically butchered it 
and put it together in a very unsuccessful way. So this is the car I would not drive, would not choose, and I would definitely want to crash it a lot. Maybe that would help it. Moving on, this is tough. We're gonna to go now to the Rossellini Tempesta. And I know it's got a little bit of influences from Ferrari, specifically two cars that I'm very familiar with from my time at Ferrari. Uh, not so much the 360 Modena, which was already done when I got there, but the F430. Now I'm looking at this and trying to find the hints of the F430. You might say the front intakes on either side, but it's only in the position. You might say, uh, you might not say anything. This car doesn't relate to the F430, sorry guys, uh, or even to the 360 Modena. I don't know, the air intakes in the front maybe more 360-ish, but that's about it. So let's get into the car itself. Now, if we move to the side of the vehicle, I'm starting to get some vibes from Lamborghini. That belt line, the line that separates the, the window or the glass area from the body, does have that sort of break when it has to come back up into the windscreen, the windshield area. That is very typical Lamborghini. So I do see that there. If you move down the body side on the door, you can start to see the intakes in there. That is a little bit Ferrari-esque. They typically take air in even that low on some of them. It's all about elevating it. It's about bringing it all to almost to a conclusion where we have one here, one here. We need to blend those two together, bring it to a higher height, and then we'll have something that is actually more than the sum of its parts, more than just a Lamborghini, more than just a Ferrari that have been started on, but they haven't reached that pinnacle, they haven't reached that conclusion of what the overall design is. They haven't blended well, they need to stir it up a little bit more so that we have something that looks like more than just a Lamborghini and a Ferrari. Moving on to the next one. Now this is gonna be a, an interesting one too because this car, I recognize it, or at least bits and pieces of it. This one's called the Watson 25 V16 Revenge. Maybe their purpose isn't to design something that is way out there, but the car is, is, is quite normal in the sense of being able to run on the roads today. Whoever's done this probably has a design education. There are a few things that obviously don't work on it uh, because of the way it's designed. But if we look at it from the front, it's a very strong, powerful looking front end. Almost no bumper impact area, which is great because we don't like bumpers, we know that. I like the way they've considered airflow on this car. It's got a uh, sensible airflow uh, design. So there is air going in and it's suddenly evacuating uh, as quickly as possible. It's probably not good aerodynamically to have parts of your front tire exposed to the wind. I don't know how anybody's gonna look at those rear view mirrors mounted up there, if you're even gonna see them, because if you look at the angle where the driver is probably sitting, you gotta look through the A-pillar to see the mirror. So that's nice and wild, but maybe they're not uh, mirrors, I don't know. Love the hips, love the surface development on the rear fenders, the way it really swells out. When a designer has the freedom to be able to push limits, I think uh, uh, they've, they've not gone far enough with the limits that design uh, without regulations would allow them to do. And if you saw this car on the road, probably it would, would make you gasp. Good looking car, I like it. It's my favorite one up to now that I've reviewed. Um, but again, uh, if you're gonna push limits, push limits. Now we move to the next one. The next one is the Carson Thunder Custom. Now this is a fun one because I can just relate to it immediately from the custom paint job. Uh, I started off before I even started designing cars uh, in custom painting, so I, I understand the culture, the hot rod flame, 
the pinstriping, uh, the color blending, the candy colors, everything like this that uh, this car is showing off. So this is what we would typically call a lead sled, where the car is lowered quite a bit. It's, it's lead, it's heavy. Uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's basically very planted on the road. You can see how much it's been lowered. It's a cool car. I mean, it's got that aggressive sort of, you don't imagine this car going fast, but it's basically rumbling through the streets. Really deep throated V8 sound to it. This would have been beautiful on the road when it first came out. And the modernized version here is taking it a step further. Again, it's something you would see in the hot rod culture. But I like this because it's not feasible. It just looks cool. And again, it's not a high speed car probably. Although those flames on there, typical hot rod flames. I love the color blending. I love that uh, magenta, the use of fuchsia on the front. I can imagine that the rear end is probably just as gorgeous. It'd be a shame to actually crash this thing. You can imagine the amount of work that goes into preparing, customizing a car to this level. Now we move on to the Nakamura Firehawk V4. So this is basically what you would look at if you were looking at a Honda Fire Blade that was basically changed slightly in terms of color. Because all the engineering is still basic there. But even basically the, the, from an engineering point, if you're going to make a, a, a more high tech or more uh, different looking bike, you would start with basic elements like perhaps the, the fairing on the front, the mirrors on the front, um, definitely the exhaust pipes. We, uh, th this type of exhaust pipe system tends to, to date the bikes. I know that there are still bikes out there that are doing this. A beautiful bike, it will always look great. It's one of the classic beautiful designs of, of, the, of the super bike era, today's super bike era. But there are much newer designs and I think if we're gonna look at this bike in terms of being something you want to choose to ride on, you would probably want to choose something that looks a little bit more radical. Interesting paint job, interesting graphics. Uh, just a shame that the, uh, uh, the look of it doesn't give you that, what we call today the, uh, the surprise and delight, you know, that kind of wow factor feel to it. And moving on to the Rossellini LM Classic. Now the Rossellini LM Classic is definitely a hark back to the, the 60s when Ferrari was involved in uh, endurance racing. So there are a few cars in the history there that we can trace back to, namely the P3, P4 perhaps a bit of a GT40 from that rear three-quarter view. At the same time, this car is definitely a sexy looking car. I guess you have to attribute it to those, those curves, the fenders, and that windscreen, that typical uh, Ferrari-esque uh, P3, P4 type windscreen in the front. So it's a bit of an edgy design, yet still sympathizing, I guess, with the, with the softness of that age of vehicle. So if you look at this and you compare it a little bit with that P72 from Joe and Wong, uh, great friend, hi Joe. This one is a little bit more tame, I would say. I do like it uh, mostly, I would say, from the front view. The rear view kind of gives me the impression that they were trying to give it a look uh, with, that, with that kind of cattier Batman style uh, way the rear fender finishes off from the rear view and you sort of get the, the lights tucked in there. Overall, my conclusion on the Rossellini LM Classic is I like it. It's a fresh approach to organic design. It does look like a fast car. It does look quick and maneuverable and highly agile and mobile. But uh, whether you would want to crash a car like this, this car looks expensive. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it right, do it in style, do it with the Rossellini LM Classic. So in summary, what can I say about this? Well, I expected it to be a little bit more extreme. The thing I would probably have done is radicalize the cars a little bit more. There's a lot of room to, to maneuver within this game to produce cars that could be potentially a lot more pushing the limits, let's say. So that's my only critique on this version 
of the game is that I think the cars that we're looking at should be perhaps more unrealistic, uh, still believable, but more unrealistic in the sense that you question the, the feasibility, the actual um, uh, potential to actually see these cars on the road. That would make the cars here more extreme, more exciting to look at, uh, more fun probably to be, uh, uh, to be enjoying, to drive, and to give you that, that vision of something that is unattainable, but you can attain it in the game at least. So there you have it, my review of the cars in Burnout Paradise. Let me know in the comments below what games you want me to review and I'll have a good look at those. And we'll come back with another review of your choices. Thanks very much. See you in the future.